go on Mr. Google and type in in Japanese WW2 pilot Nuburo Fujita and you'll come up with one chief result the only combatant to bomb the continental United States in the war after he dropped incendiary bombs into an Oregon forest in a failed attempt to start a large fire exactly like the one the state experienced just this year this attack on US soil in September 1942 defined his military career and later life made Fujita a high profile hero in his homeland the life of warrant officer Noboru Fujita, conscripted into the Imperial Japanese Navy in 1932, was much more interesting and daring than one single mission. Fujita's first foray was on board Samaroon I-25, 100 miles off the coast of Hawaii in the lead-up to Pearl Harbor. Only, his pre-attack reconnaissance flight was curtailed when his Yokoshuka Glen E-14Y developed mechanical problems. The 8.5 metre long two-man Glen was powered by a nine-cylinder radial piston engine with a three-blade propeller. A radial engine has a distinctive sound to it. When I was in Canada recently, I got to fly in this seaplane. Indeed, 80 years later, the radial aircraft engines are still spluttering along. Fujita flew over Sydney Harbour with his navigator petty officer, Shuji Okuda. I couldn't dig up a photo of him. I can tell you, however, Okuda would be killed two years later in another theatre. Fujita would fly high above a Kodiak, Alaska to suss out the US deployments and the precursor to the landings on the Aleutian Islands. And these were all nighttime jaunts with a top speed of just 250 kilometers an hour. And they would have been dog meat within 30 minutes in daytime. When his own flying days were over, he trained kamikaze pilots. I tell you what, prior to his appointment, boy with the Japanese kamikaze health and safety protocols all over the place. And of course, because this is, after all, a New Zealand history site, and two flights over New Zealand. But before I get to them, I need to go over the strategic role played by the Japanese submarine fleet in World War II. Especially as subs played a pinnacle role in his time in the service, and after all, he was a member of the Navy and not the Air Force. As a signatory to the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922, Japan's surface fleet was limited, along with those of the other victorious allies. And to make up for this, Japan threw resources into a submarine development. When Japan entered the war in September 1940, their submarines were the most deadly and capable of any under the sea. Torpedoes similarly, and Germans included. Innovations like the one we've touched on. Ability to carry and deploy mini subs. The reason why Japanese subs didn't play a greater role in WW2 are many. Interforce bickering as Army, Air Force, and Navy are polyticked over their slice of the pie. Japanese tactics sucked. And they were seen as being part of a greater naval force, not lone wolves. Went big into resource sapping construction of battleships, soon to become a floating pin cushions for carrier launched aircraft. In the Pacific, they were commanded to look after military targets, not to waste torpedoes on transports and cargo ships, and go for the big fish, not the little ones. Thus, restricted warfare, to start with at least. That's before we even get to the major reason Japanese subs were a side player. Irrespective of a technological superiority, there simply weren't enough of them. Just 176 throughout the entire war, only 60 when the whistle blew. In ponds the size of the Pacific and Indian Oceans, almost exactly a thousand less than the Germans produced. From those 176 subs, they sank just 184 vessels between 41 and 45. 
an insignificant number when placed against the German U-boat's 3,000 victims. At one point, Japanese submarines were reduced to dropping dummy periscopes made of bamboo randomly. Not only would it put allies off the scent of the real sub, they would make it appear there were heaps of them. There weren't. Fujita was highly aware of these inadequacies. He was one of the proponents to change tactics. Suggested, besides the submarine force undertaking clandestine scouting missions, they would drop an odd bomb or two, surface and fire shells at key targets that might go boom, oil installations spring to mind, and big value targets as well, vital for the war effort, like the Panama Canal. This strategy would divert resources away from the battles occurring thousands of miles away and back to the home fronts in Sydney or LA. And in doing so, the Allies would inadvertently end up chasing phantoms. At the same time, this relatively small force of submarines would instill fear amongst the populace, make Mr and Mrs Bloggs think they weren't safe where they were. It certainly worked. The psychological warfare played by Japanese submarines was more effective than the military one. What the public of New Zealand didn't know was that the Japanese only had a hundred submarines to play with on a good day. Stories still exist today of a sub and plane sightings here, there and everywhere. I hate to spoil a good story. The records back in Germany and Japan indicate these simply could not have happened. In fact, the only known German submarine to get close to the mainland of New Zealand was the one I recently covered, U-862, in the last months of the war, plus four subs from the Imperial Japanese Navy during 1942 and 43. The biggest Axis New Zealand sub-stories that bubble along and occasionally resurface now and again is the Japanese sub residing on the floor of the ocean off the Kaikoura coast, which I've covered in a previous video. That's a strikeout. And U196, which is an enigmatic rumour, so wild, I have to get my teeth into it at some point. And now to contradict myself, as you're about to learn shortly, some of the reports out of Japan that were taken as gospel on closer scrutiny weren't Let's now go off to the shores of Hobart, Tasmania, on the 4th of March, 1942. After having reconnoitred Hobart Harbour in the West Moors and found diddly in terms of warships, Fujita and Okuda were back at I-25 as dawn was breaking, and their day would get worse. Whilst craning the glen aboard, the plane would get thrown against the side of the sub, damaging one of the plywood wings. The craft carried spears for the plane and engineers to tinker about, and not a spear wing. All they could do was complete a patch-up job on the four-day journey to New Zealand. When the repaired aircraft came out of the hangar on the 8th of March, Fujita wasn't a happy chappy. He considered the aircraft to be unairworthy. However, he was overruled by sub-commander Takayami Machi and told to get on with his flight over Wellington. Julie took off from the sub in darkness, returning four hours later. The most vulnerable time for the sub was when it was on the surface, constructing and deconstructing the aircraft. They needn't have worried. As far as the military records go here in New Zealand, Air Force, coastal observers, Navy patrols, etc., that flight was not spotted by anyone. Nor could I find any records of Wellingtonians phoning in reports of a strange aircraft buzzing about at three in the morning. It was now up the east coast of the North Island. When we jumped forward four days, slash nights, to the 12th, Fujita and Okuda uneventfully scooted over Auckland, chiefly the naval base in Devonport. If your grandmother or dead uncle from Takapuna spotted the glen in the darkened skies over Auckland that night, somehow were experts in aircraft engines, distinguished the sound as being Japanese. They must have been rather unconcerned and gone back to sleep soon after because no one bothered calling the authorities. The same can be said of the submarine. And this is where it gets murky or where the official records in Japan need to be corrected. 
Those records in Japan say two things. Firstly, I-25 was discovered by two New Zealand Navy vessels off Great Barrier Island on the afternoon of the 12th. These vessels attacked, dropping depth charges, which proved ineffectual. We know this can't have happened. And that's because the only two vessels that could have affected such an attack, the converted trawler Coast Guard and Ditto Kaiwaka, were both at the time all the way up in Fiji laying defensive mines. Another thing in I-25's report from its time in Auckland Harbour, and that must be a mistake or an embellishment widely publicised as occurring, was I-25 sank a large steamer in the Hauraki Gulf? This definitely didn't happen. We'd know about it, it would have been front page news. There was of course a possibility I-25 saw a target in the form of a vessel of some kind and launched a torpedo or two, for what was mentioned. The explosion they heard was perhaps a malfunction or striking something less substantial than a surface vessel. Not that we'll ever get an answer. Next stop for I-25 was Fiji, then back home on the 4th of April. When we find out a Japanese report weren't correct, it opens up a faint glimmer of hope that other access records at some level could be wrong. Historically, whether or not I-25 got it wrong detailing an attack on a steamer being pursued by New Zealand Navy vessels, doesn't change the fact we only know of five submarines around New Zealand in World War II. We also have those submarines logs. We are able to tell easily where they were on any given day. And that makes it easy to discount stories like there was a Japanese submarine in Melbourne Sound when the year it was alleged to have happened, 1944, there were no incursions. At that time, and Japanese subs were involved running American blockades to resupply beleaguered cut-off forces in the likes of the Solomon Islands. You can almost rule out a Kaikoura based on that fact alone. This video though won't dampen pub stories like German submarine crews were spotted on shore milking cows and stealing eggs. And Wellingtonians got front row seats as the Glen was chased by New Zealand Air Force Tiger Moths out into Cook Strait. All which I enjoy hearing for the sheer entertainment value. The granddaddy of the granddaddy stories is U196. That I will tackle at some point. After doing a lot of reading, New Zealand Navy history was particularly useful in getting info from the nice people that New Zealand Navy in Auckland and the Air Force here in Christchurch. I've come to the conclusion that any Kiwis who spotted submarines in WW2 were likely been isolated to windswept cliff tops or on board trawlers. One of the top reasons why Noboro Fujita lived to 85 was he wasn't spotted doing his thing in the air or on the water at least in enough time to affect anything decisive. Next up in my to-do pile is another story where fact and fiction have become blurred involving gold that's been lost, a disaster that's been forgotten. Thanks for tuning in today and bye for now.